you need to hit okay or got it then. Okay, everyone. Uh, Rachel Newman is one of my best friends. And as I mentioned before, she's a good neighbor. Before moving to New York City, Rachel grew up in Boston and Virginia. She studied art history and philosophy at Penn State. And then she moved to New York City. Her career was as a magazine editor, including editor emeritus of Country Living. She's an avid traveler who's been to over 40 countries. During retirement, she continues to have many connections to the publishing industry. She has many friends with varied interests. Two of her best friends have already spoken at the Lyceum. Cosette Bonjour gave a class, I don't think any of you guys were in it, on, a, on a personal life coaching. She was coaching us. And Nadine and Salako and her husband, Joe Vincent, gave two classes, one on Italian cooking and one on Tuscan landscape painting. Uh, Rachel took classes with Nadine and Joe. Uh, and I actually took three classes with Nadine and Joe, although I don't have much to prove it. Uh, uh, and uh, that was the start of Rachel reinventing herself as a talented painter and her work sell around the globe. Uh, Rachel was planning to speak previously, as I think a couple of you know, but had to cancel due to her husband's declining health. At any rate, she's here with us to converse now. She would really like a dialogue, so feel free to leave your uh, mics open and ask questions. Uh, if you put something in the chat, it might take me a while to notice because I'm running the slides. And then if you don't mind, before we start, I'd just like to go around the room and have everybody introduce themselves and maybe talk about why they're interested in the class. And if there's something specific you would like to get out of the class, if you would be willing to share it. Also, if any of you are artists and would like to share some of your work, maybe you could get it together when we break at the one hour mark. Uh, so let's see. Uh, Barbara Ann, you're off mic. Why don't you tell us why you're here? I um, am not an artist, but I love art. My favorite thing is going to art museums wherever I might be. I don't. I haven't traveled all that much, so I don't, you know, but uh, so I appreciate art and um, anything else I can learn about it is, is just a bonus. Uh, Gabriella? Hi, I do live in the Boston area. I'm, I'm, I live in Malden, Massachusetts. Uh, I think someone mentioned they were born here. Um, I'm a BU alum, um, and my mother, um, Rosie Snyder, had told me about this oh, class. Oh, yeah, Rosie. The Rosie. Rosie's never late. Yes, I don't know what happened okay. to her. But I think I picked up my uh, love of, of art from, from her. I'm not an artist, but I, um, whenever our family gets together, art museums are on the agenda. So um, I'm always interested. Uh, Donna, are you there? Uh, I'm Robin, and um, our, we're doing construction work in here, and that's why I do not have the image up. So um, I just want to say hello to everyone. Um, I've had a li lifelong love of art and travel, um, and the topic just seems like it would be very intriguing. Um, so. I am interested to hear um, about the speaker's adventures um, and the background. I was and, learning about how art. many classes have you taught? Pardon? How many, how many art classes have you taught at the Lyceum? Oh, I've only done two, um, but my background um, is art. Um, I've got a master's in art history and studio arts, and I taught, um, for about 24 years um, in public schools, mostly elementary, but I have taught um, high school too. Um, we'll let Eileen go last. Elliot, how are you doing? I'm doing good. So uh, I am a, uh, an analog photographer and used to have a lab. I also have a loom upstairs and I haven't touched that in a lot of years. And my wife was um, a painter. And in my youth, uh, I worked for a design company and um, my boss always set aside 1%, one to 10% for buying art. And I was very fortunate to 
uh, he used to give me $10,000 in cash and I used to run up to New York and you would appreciate this. Uh, I used to go to Castelli Galleries and there was a guy named Ivan Karp and Ivan had slides of everybody who was painting in New York at the time. And we would look at slides of people doing of their work and then I would run around mostly Soho, which wasn't like Soho is now, of buying paintings and putting them in a truck for corporate art. So it was, it was fun. So I'm interested, I'm interested. I, I've, been, I've been hanging around a lot of people who know how to paint. I don't know how to do that. Well, I don't know where Eileen went, uh, went. She beat a hasty retreat. So by the way, before most of you came on, Gabrielle to also told us that she's a singer. So she's a, yeah. Um, so I'll just mention uh, just the, so I've actually went to Italy twice and to Massachusetts once with Rachel to Najin and Joe's classes. And they really are quite good because they, even if, I mean, I basically, before I went to the first class, all I did was doodle while I was doing accounting at work. But Rachel <laughs> convinced me to go because uh, I'm very worried about Alzheimer's. And uh, she said, maybe it's time to start using a different part of your brain. And then I also studied with her here in the city, although not at our favorite place. And maybe someday I'll go where she, the other place she's studying now, which she'll tell you about. So I guess we lost Eileen. So I'm gonna start the screen share and uh, Rachel can start. Go you ahead. ready? Okay. Actually hearing all of you speak and hearing about what you do, I think I'm, I think I'm gonna be preaching to the choir. <laughs> <laughs> anyway um yeah i had the whole thing prepared for people that i thought were just either beginners or wannabes or or uh wanting to know how to get going or anyway i was going to start out with the whole philosophy anyway um we want to hear your philosophy okay well all right just uh, um just on the subject of being a painter i'm sure you all have heard the line and some of it have it maybe even used it when it comes to painting. And that line is, I can't even draw a straight line. Mm -hmm. um, well, I can't either. Never could and never will. But with training and with the right tools, I learned how to draw a straight line. Anybody can. Um, and it's like that, I think, with painting. If you learn the principles of creating a picture and learn about the tools to use, learn about color, which, by the way, is a science, you're halfway there. But the most important thing, is having the desire to do it. And once you're there, once you have that desire, um, and I think I think it sounds like some of you are in that category. Once you have a desire, you're ready to go. Now that desire can come from many forms. And here comes my philosophical part. The question, what makes a person want to paint or draw or sculpt or, or any of the traditional conventional arts um, just as each of us has our own personality, every person will have their own answer to that question. And once they begin to paint, they're on, they're, they'll have their own style and their own look. In my own case, I've come to the conclusion that when I see something beautiful, whether it's a landscape, a flower, or just an old ceramic pot, I want to possess it. And the only way for me to possess it is to copy it. Now, I know that could be articulated in another way, but that's the bottom line for me. And in a sense, calling myself creative is a certain sense, a sense of irony about it, because I always think the word creative means making something entirely unique, new, never seen before. But I'm not doing that. I'm just copying something that is already there. And there's the conundrum. So when people um, ask me why I paint, I just say, because it's fun. And the more you do it, and the more you learn how to do it, the more fun it gets. And the other thing is about painting that is wonderful is it's something you can do alone, um, all alone, meaning you don't need to be with somebody else to do it. In fact, most paint painters I know, even if they're still studying, prefer to be alone, but that's another topic. Um, now, right now, before I get into my, my own story, I'd like to thank my dear friend, Robin, for not only inviting me to speak to you, but for organizing and taking all the photos you'll be seeing today. She has designed 
has designed a chronological biography of my life and pictures and has made this much easier for me. Okay, go to the next one. Um, oh, now about my father, Maurice Newman. By the way, I'm the one that was born in Malden. Um, my, that's a, a painting, it's a self portrait of my father. In the middle is uh, my father's portrait of my mother long before I knew her. And the, uh, the one at the right is me as a 12 year old. And I think you can tell by the sad look on my face, I didn't like posing very much. <laughs> Anyway, I was surrounded by paintings, my father's paintings from the time I was born. My father was an artist and a sculptor. He left Lithuania when he was 12, alone, and spent time in Davos and San Moritz, then boarded a ship bound for the USA, but got off in South Africa when they were gonna be um, refueling for six hours. He lost his way, and though he spoke five languages, English was not one of them. So he ended up in Johannesburg for seven years. He finally made it to the States in 1923. And that's the only date I'm sure about in his life because I found his name on the roster at Ellis Island. I'm not sure where my father got the money, but I know he spent some time in New York at, at the Cooper Union and finally made his way to Boston where his mother and siblings had landed earlier. He met my mother there in the late twenties when they were in a small a theater group together. My mother was playing Helen of Troy, and my father was working on the sets. As the story goes, my father was making a mirror for her. It was a later life marriage for them both, and I was born in 1938 when my mother was 43. Now, um, this painting at the left is myself at 12. I still wasn't very happy about having to pose. Um, no, 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 sorry, that's earlier. That was six. The other one was 12. Uh, and the paintings next, painting next to that were all my original toys. We lived in a beach, at the beach um, in Rockport, Massachusetts then. And I still have that painting. It's in my bedroom, I treasure it. Um, the photograph at the right is my parents, again, long before I knew them. And, um, and then my, a, a charcoal of my mother. Um, let's see, go to the, you can go to the next one. I'm gonna start winging it because, yeah, okay. We moved to Rockport. Rockport is an art colony on Cape Ann outside of, outside of Boston. Um, the, the large painting at the left, which I have over my mantle here in New York, um, shows in the very center, on the left side center where Robin has an arrow. Uh, that's a two year old there with my babysitter. And the group of people are around the table, lobster, um, Rockport is lobster land, and that's my mother serving a lobster dinner. And uh, that's a painting that um, has, has just been with me my whole life. It, it's a large, uh, what I consider large. And then the right is, uh, uh, Rockport is right next to Gloucester, and Gloucester was another art colony, and the iconic paintings coming out of uh, Gloucester were boats. You can go to the next one. Okay. Okay, and this little strange painting at the left, which I have here now, is the earliest painting that I have of my father's, and it's dated 1932. Um, and the painting at the right is um, the painting my mother always referred to as my father's Cezanne. And the little picture up at the right is a Trompe painting I did using my father's palette, which I still have with all the paint still on it. I brightened up the colors because of course it's, it's, it's aged, it's very old now. Um, but that was something I did in the Trompe class. Um, I, after my mother died, um, I discovered a whole portfolio she, that she had of my father's drawings and, and um, ink, dra ink drawings and charcoal drawings. And uh, these three are, um, from six that I found that I have hanging in my living room right now. And I can't quite date them, but I think this had to be when he was at Cooper Union. And you can tell from the hairstyles because the men had their hair part in the middle. And one of the pictures here that you can't see, the woman is wearing a, a Louise Brooks haircut. And my father was also, he also did models and dioramas. And the, the simple Simon at the right 
it was made for the World's Fair. And the one below that's very hazy because it was photographed through glass is a main street in Boston. These were done in the, probably in the 30s. Um, my mother always told the story. My father was kept away, kept alive by doing WA pro, WPA projects and teaching art to children. Um, then in, in the second, when the Second World War started, he was hired to be a model maker for the engineer research development labs at Fort Belvoir in Alexandria, Virginia, just across the Potomac from Washington, D.C. His, his work was top secret then, but what he was actually doing was making topographical bombing maps of Germany for the war effort. I had my fourth birthday in Alexandria. My father continued his painting at home in his small study a studio and, um, and did commissions for portraits and occasionally landscapes. Rachel, can I say something that just sure. occurred to me? Yeah. This little girl in the beaker is probably you too. No, I was, this was, be, this is when I was Before still an you. infant. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, next, next one. Um, this, this is also Rockport. The one at the left is Rockport with a church called the Old Sloop. Um, and it doesn't look like that anymore, but I remember it when it did look like that. Uh, and the picture at the right, my father actually did when, when my parents were just married and they had their honeymoon in Rockport. And that's my mother leaning against uh, on the wharf reading. Um, my father, um, after retirement, my father was given a commission to do to design and build a monument to the um, Holocaust, but specifically uh, commissioned by victims uh, and the survivors of the Warsaw Ghetto. So this monument was um, his, his way of depicting the ghetto and the, it was all of aluminum. It was going to be outside of outside a Jewish community center in Kansas City. And um, the flames, he inscribed all the names of the people who had perished. And below that, there was a map of the ghetto. Below that, um, the people being rounded up and taken away. Um, he got a lot of press for it. Harry Truman uh, gave an address at the opening and my father considered that, you know, he's the greatest thing in his life that had happened to him. Uh, sadly, um, he had a, stroke, a crippling stroke at 70 and died at 79. Uh, um, Robin has been kind enough to do this timeline time line of my father, me, and my travel, but I don't know. Uh, I don't know if, I, if you can read it anyway. Um, yeah, I think it's it's, it's sludge, but yeah, it's easily readable. It is readable. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for supporting. <laughs> um, I haven't talked much about my mother, but um, her, her name was Edith Brenda Titchell Newman. She was a loving, supporting, and what, and what I would call a classic mother of the 40s and 50s. She taught me to read, knit, crochet, and sew. And she encouraged me to study and have friends and clean up my room and make sure I took care of my reputation, which in those days meant no sex unless I was married. And if I did all those things, I'd be a good wife or some man. The irony about my mother was that those were her mother's values. Her mother was a Victorian. Actually, my mother was a flapper, a suffragette, and she started her own business, a bookshop, long before she was even married, and said to me, don't rush into marriage, but have a career. She lived on the cusp of a new era, and years later, I did too. Okay. Um. Okay. Well, Robin already told you, told you a lot about my past, but I graduated from Penn State in 1960 with a major in liberal arts, philosophy, and sociology. My mother told me not to learn to type because I'd end up being a secretary, even though she was a typing teacher for the soldiers at Fort Belvoir. 1960. 
That's the year the world, or I should say my world changed. I moved to New York City. Drugs came in, computers arrived, and so did the twists. And the thing to do if you were fresh out of college was to go to the Peppermint Lounge in New York City and watch Chubby Checkers teach everybody how to twist. I'm gonna race through the next couple of years. Otherwise, I'll be here. you'd be here all night long. I went into advertising. Couldn't go into publishing because I couldn't type. I spent two years bored out of my skull as a media estimator and wanting to be creative, quit the business, which was the prototype for Mad Men, went to work for a sculptor in Greenwich Village. I was the gallery manager, which meant I swept the floor, spoke nicely to the customers and modeled for him, clothed. He sold little and couldn't pay me, but did a portrait bust of me, which I accepted, but it didn't pay my bills. So I had to quit. Then I took a job in an interior de design firm on 57th Street selling wallpaper. And at night, I went to the New York School of Interior Design to get a degree to become an interior decorator. Then the book, Europe and $5 a Day, was published. I took my graduation present of $1,000 and booked a round trip ticket on the France and went to Europe for three months, all on the $1,000 and a new life began for me. Europe was a dream world for me, especially Italy, the architecture, the art, the archeology. span And had I, not, had I not have had older parents that would need looking after, or if I had siblings, I would have stayed in Europe for an indefinite time. But instead I found a way to get back to Europe everywhere, every year and did so for the next 58 years until COVID happened. As for a career, I hadn't the slightest idea what I wanted to do. All I knew was that I wanted to do something creative. While working at the design firm, the art director of Women's Wear Daily came in and we got talking. I mentioned that I was about to take my first trip to Europe and he said to get in touch with him when I returned. I did. He put me in the art department and then I switched to the editorial department. I was thrilled. I was going to be a fashion market editor. And since it was a publishing job, I had to quickly learn to type, but some fashion. I covered house dresses, half sizes, uniforms, and aprons. Then I was promoted to accessories where I covered handbags, shoes, and gloves. From women's wear, I moved to a glove manufacturer to do their publicity and soon found myself designing gloves. As you now can realize, I was all over the place without any kind of specific direction. So I went to NYU and took um, a rather expensive vocational and psychological evaluation test that took several days. The recommendation at the end of this testing was that I should become either an archaeologist or a dentist. Since archaeology was one of my interests, I decided to go back to school for that at night. I eventually took a job on a magazine called You Do It Home Decorating and went to school at night. It, then um, I, it was there that I met my publishing mentor, a man named John Mac Carter, who was one of the top editors in the city. Um, he was the editor of all the, all the women's service magazines. He gave me the job of developing a new magazine called Country Living. And my archaeology career uh, was set aside. The next 20 years, I had a dream job. Country living was about period homes and collecting antiques. I was able to travel all over the United States in search of regional vernacular and went to Europe to search out the roots of our American styles. And in my last four years before I retired, I was allowed to start a magazine about another of my interests, and that's art alternative alternative and natural health. But in 1998, two years before I retired, something happened that changed my life. I read a piece in the New York Times travel section, a tiny three column inch piece that said, go to Tuscany and learn to paint landscapes. And so I did. By the end of that week of learning to paint in Tuscany, I knew what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And I came home and bought the, the easel, the paints, et cetera, et cetera. Now, some of you, have, well, Robin talked about it. Um, Nadine in Sulaco was my, was my teacher who had started this, 
Medical School in Tuscany. Um, and she runs this now with her husband, Joe, and I have been going there since 98. And I would say from what other people report to us that have been to other workshops, um, that it's probably the best plenier workshop in all of Europe. Um, okay, these are a lot of Medine's paintings and she does landscape and still life. These are Joe's. Joe is also an abstract painter and does wonderful landscapes. So in 2000, when I retired, Medina invited me to be the assistant for a period of six weeks. And we went to a little town, a little mid medieval town called Boncovento to look at a, a building, a 14th century building that was being renovated into condos. Um, because me, Medina and Joe spent half their year in Italy and they bought one and I bought one. Uh, they then expanded their venues to Civita Castellana nearer to Rome and finally added a workshop here in the United States to paint the marshes in Ipswich, Massachusetts. Um, that, this, this um, story, Follow the Dream did appear in Country Living. It was after I retired, but um, the person that took my job decided she wanted to shoot the, shoot the uh, apartment. The only problem is the, the big opening spread, which you see here. That's not my apartment. That's, that's a farm building someplace. This was the interior of my apartment. And um, I spent eight years with that apartment. Um, let's see, no, I don't think you can see it. Five point up. Oh, okay. Go ahead. The, 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 okay. Robin's got the, uh, a red dot. That's where my apartment was. Um, that, that was my bedroom window and the, my terrace was the, went right across the arch, which was the gate to the town. It was one of the most wonderful experiences I've ever had. The Dean shepherded it through. I couldn't speak a word of Italian, but for eight years, I had that apartment and went there twice a year for anywhere from two to six weeks and painted and painted and painted and painted. And um, Medine and Joe were right upstairs. It was, it was just a great experience. Um, Medine's teaching is holistic. Um, she will take a beginner. I, I think she used to say she, in the days before 9-11 and COVID, um, they used to have classes that could have been 12, as many as 12 people and she would take up to six beginners in a class and she still will take beginners. She has several different kinds of classes and the first one is called fundamentals and that's for people that have probably never drawn or painted in their lives. But she teaches you how to draw, how to measure, how to look at light, about color. She gives you the right books to read, the right books to buy about the color circle. And um, I just learned so much, not only about the old masters, but about more contemporary painters too, that I had no, I knew nothing about at the time. Okay, next. Yeah, wait, 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 the quotes. Oh, the quotes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, one of the books that she would quote from had two quotes that I love. Um, Hawthorne was trying to say, you have to be excited about what you paint. And he said, if you're not going to get a thrill, how can get you give somebody else one? And then he also said, if you look into the past of a successful painter, you will find miles and miles of canvas behind him. And that is so true. I have a house full of, full of paintings, um, most of which I don't like, but I've, I was always told you should never throw any of your paintings away. Um, and these are some of the uh, places I painted. Now, the first painting is actually from my first workshop and it's a palette knife painting. Most, Dean makes you do a palette knife painting on your first workshop. Most people hate doing that. I loved it because it was the only painting I was able to bring home that week because the rest of them were horrible. And I still have that paint, painting. I'll always treasure, treasure it because I had so much fun doing it. 
uh, the, se the second, I'm just gonna go really fast with the paintings now because this is gonna take off too much time. Uh, that's the from the island of Elba. Um, sometimes I would paint, actually paint, paint plein air, that's meaning being right there outdoors, and sometimes from pictures. This is from the picture I took. Uh, the next one is from an abbey where we painted, did many, Medina did many, many classes, and that's just a part of the abbey wall that was done on site, as were the next two on the bottom, two views of this um, house, large house in Tuscany near Bonquevento. Um, and it's, it's one of my favorite venues. It's a vineyard, it's, it has terraces, and the house was the, it was owned by um, an Italian landscape painter and he bought it because it had a 360 degree view. And the last painting on the bottom right um, is actually the Alhambra in Granada, but I haven't been there. That is from a travel po poster that I saw that I loved, so I copied it. I've been, it's awesome. Get a private tour, don't go with everybody. What? Oh. It's like a madhouse. <laughs> Uh, uh the, these are more from the workshops um uh, um that's the cottage of of people that uh, uh that own the the big house i showed you in the past then at the end of each day of painting we get critiques and everybody has their paintings all lined up and joe and Medin tell us what's good bad and indifferent and it's really it's very it's wonderful um i was scared the first time because i was afraid i was i knew i was going to be criticized about everything but it wasn't that way. We we learn not only about what we're doing ourselves, but from what other people are doing. Uh, this is just a tree at the Abbey. The top right is actually a graveyard. And I painted that because I love the olive trees out front and I wanted to work on olive trees, which are, which are very difficult to do. And the bottom right is painting inside of a wall. It was a day that was very, very windy and we couldn't paint completely out of doors because our easels wouldn't have stood up. So uh, we were painting in completely surrounded by this wall and painting there. Okay. Um, typical Tuck, Tuscan landscape where there's a house on a hill and maritime pines alternate with cypress trees. And then the right is one of those Tuscan, typical Tuscan homes. And lower left is, um, the hills of Tuscany with, with uh, vineyards. And then uh, myself painting on the loggia of that estate that I first showed you the picture of. So it was, it was a rainy day, so we were out in the loggia painting. And then another landscape, one of my very early uh, landscapes with uh, vineyards. I painted a lot of vineyards. Uh, the two at the above, again, Tuscan houses, typical Tuscan houses in the hills. We were near, um, if, if you all have traveled, any of you have traveled to um, Montalcino, the wine town, our town, Boncovento, was right near Montalcino. In fact, the hills in the back that you see are Montalcino. And um, these are all from, really from the same location. And um, I'm up there painting with a little umbrella to give me some shade. You try not to paint in full sun. Uh, and um, this is just this pot. I just kind of fell in love with that old terracotta pot. And this is an exercise in doing, um, having the distance move back and back and back and back. Um, Medin's has another class called Elements, and each day you take a different aspect of painting out of doors. And uh, this day was to all about light and the changing light. So we did the same thing in the morning light and then in the afternoon light to show how the shadows change everything. The red wagons up at the top are the wagons that they have during the Vendamia, which is the wine harvest. Um, this is just a, a selection of things around Italy. This building, this strange looking building is actually an old electrical, I, I guess it was, I, it's not a factory, it was just an electrical station. facility. It was a station on, on the Arno River. 
and the painting at the right is actually done on painting on paper. It's quite large, and it was done from Leno, the town where um, on Lake Como, where George Clooney has his estate. Um, another day in Medine's fundamental classes, we paint clouds. And clouds, I we are taught, um, have have a warm and a cool side, and you always have to put yellow paint on the warm side, and and you know, old cool paint colors on the underside. And we did we do many many cloud studies on that week. I think Robin has a few of mine. Um, another thing that we're taught in doing landscape painting is to tone our canvases. Um, and you usually tone your canvas with a sienna color. And that's so that if you skip a, a place, if you skip a piece of the canvas when you're painting, you won't have little white flecks of the canvas showing through. But with the three top paintings, I went all the way to bright red. I used bright red underneath. Um, because green being the complement of red and complementary colors vibrate when they're together, I put, I let a lot of the red show through. Painting on the bottom is another painting that I did from a picture. It was a travel piece in the New York Times on some place in Germany, and I loved it. And I, that's the exact shape of the photo in the paper. So I used a canvas that was one foot by four feet. Rachel, did you do did you do the tone the canvas with the sienna because it's Tuscany? I mean, that's one of the, the things that always strikes you about the. Or would you do that with any canvas? No, I would do it with anything because it, it's well, it's warm and the earth. it's it's the, it's really an earth color, and um, that is at least that's what I was taught. Sienna is the classic thing for toning. Um, sometimes when you look in 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 the museums, you can sometimes see the toning showing through. But but I've seen people tone with blue and green, but it comes out completely differently. It looks and feels cooler when you're through painting. So um, Sienna is is the one I use most often. But I did have a lot of fun with the bright red because yeah, I, yeah, I think I think these are, these are all the ones that were were done with the bright red. Um, this is Venice. Left is Venice. Uh, it was a picture I had taken out my window in the Cantareggio area. That's the Cantareggio Canal, which is right. It's uh, the old Jewish section of Venice. And then the two at the right are the island of Burano that's right in the lagoon, right near Venice. And if you've ever been there, or, you, or if you're thinking of going there, you must go to Burano because all the houses are painted different bright colors. It's almost as if the families are competing with one another to... Um, to to get theirs uh, stand out more than the one next to them, and these are from pictures. I did not I did not drag my paints over there. But are you uh, saying Mur Murano, where the glass factory is? Oh no, Murano is also in the in the same area. It's another island. This is Borano with a B B U R A N O, and this is where they they make lace, and that's where people go to shop for lace. Um, the left is a, a just a Roman road. The second, the second middle one is a copy that I did of a John Constable painting. Um, I know my father learned to paint by going to museums and copying, but it, that's a little harder these days. The Met with the Met, it's it's a it's a struggle. You have to join a class and uh, have all kinds of credentials and everything. It's not like in Europe where you can go into the museums and paint any time you want. Um, the the painting at the right shows that I can't draw a straight line, but this is um, a church. Uh, in Tuskegee, many of the churches are black and white striped marble. And um, this one was, um, I can't even remember the town anymore, but it's from a picture that I took and I copied my, I tried to copy my picture, but didn't use my ruler enough. Again, back to the uh, on fundamentals classes. On one of the, one of the nights, we are days, we do a nocturne, but we go out the night before, find a place where there's some ambient light, take a flashlight and a notebook and a pencil, and you draw the picture that you want to paint the next day. 
but you put markings on your drawing uh, indicating the lightest lights and the darkest darks, like from one to five, one to five. You go back the next day, you draw it and paint it according to your notes. Um, the first time I went to a fundamentals class of Medine's, I thought that was ridiculous. I was not going to do that. I thought it was silly. I thought they looked silly out there with their little flashlights and everything. And um, Medine forced me to do it the next class and I ended up loving it. It was so much fun because I, I guess I was so skeptical in the beginning. I didn't think it could be done, but it can be done and it's a lot of fun. I did my best painting, do you remember that? The Three Graces. Oh. And Medine said it was because I wanted to paint it so badly. Oh. No, I'll have to see. Do you have that? Oh. Robin, by the way, she'll never admit it. She's a very good painter. I'm a very mediocre student. She, she's so. a very good painter, and I've been trying to encourage her to go back. To well, her. one thing I will say, my paintings in Ipswich look exactly the same as Rachel's. <laughs> well, I just want to say, this is from the Ipswich in the, 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 the um, I call them the swamps, but they have a better name. What are they called? Uh, the uh, the marshes, spots? the marshes. Right. This is from the, the Ipswich class. <laughs> Gabrielle's at home. She's happy. Oh, I, I couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. And I don't even think that's my painting. I think it's your painting, Robin. No, mm -hmm. I could not do it. The water kept moving in and out. And I and I, I just couldn't. There were the ticks all over the place. They were falling on my palate. That was miserable. <laughs> anyway. I, like the, I like the way you have the bushes crawling up and down the hill. <laughs> But anyway, they're they're all of us uh, getting our critique at the end of the day. Um, oh wait, a minute. now I have to go back to my. So when you buy a house in Italy, what happens? You meet somebody who can never possibly ever go to Italy with you. Right, right. Well, yeah. When I um, well the uh, okay, I'm going back to my my notes. The other way that meeting Medina and Salako indirectly changed my life was that in my early years with her, I was single. Then one day I needed to research the work of some French plein air painters. There was a print and painting gallery across the street from my apartment, the Phyllis Lucas Gallery in Old Print Center. So I went there to look for a crow lithograph or whatever I could find. The director of the gallery was Michael Lucas. That was three weeks before 9-11. Michael became my dealer, and three years later, my husband. His parents had actually worked with Salvador Dali for over a decade, uh, becoming his North American publisher and seller of his lithographs. Um, well, that, that, that's Michael and, and two picture paintings I did of him. Now, uh, there's, there's his mother, Phyllis, with Dali signing the lithographs in the gallery. And below. Oh, and below with his father. Now I knew his mother for two years for, before I ever knew she had a son because Michael was living in Germany at the time. Um, anyway, I never thought about selling my paintings, and but when Michael came into my life, it started to happen. His location in those days was on the ground floor and he had lots of walk-in customers. Um, well, We'll go on we'll talk about that later uh as you can tell robin designed this whole thing uh for me um and okay here's about the travel part um uh i took a trip to russia down the the river the, down the uh, river from um rivers from moscow to saint petersburg so here's the and, photograph and this photograph Perfect. is of saint basil's to the left in in uh, moscow and I did the painting from the photograph when I got home. Uh, the painting to the right is uh, a birch forest in Uglich, um, one of my own favorite paintings. Usually um, painters always criticize themselves and I do. Every once in a while, I'll do something I like a lot. And this one I like a lot. Um, the four little ones along the bottom, um, I did actually did from the boat, the boat, going down the river, it was very, very slow. So it was very easy for me to do these things. Um, and I did them in gouache. And for those of you who don't paint, gouache is a watercolor, but it's made opaque by uh, the addition of white. Um, so it isn't transparent. Watercolor for me is very difficult, but gouache was easy because I could handle it the same way I could handle oil painting. 
Uh, the top is Yosemite, where I spent my 60th birthday. And um, this is from a photo. And the bottom one is Hawaii. Um, and this I got from, believe it or not, um, a strip across an advert, a top of the page of an advertisement for dog food. I never really got the connection about the dog food and why they would have a picture of Hawaii, but I figured out it was Hawaii because I'd just been there for the first time and I recognized the volcanoes. Those two, there are two big ones on the big island, Mauna Loa and Mauna Kea. Um, the top left, that was from the boat. Um, and that's uh, Cliffs of White Cliffs of Dover. I, I became a, a cruise junkie, by the way, um, which when I was doing Europe on $5 a day, I ridiculed people who took cruises. But now that I'm older, I love them. Um, so that that's White Cliffs of Dover. The one to the right is a town called Les Couleurs in the south of France, where a lot of the painters went for summers to paint. Picasso, Brock, uh, and Andre Durand. Andre Durand is one of my favorite painters. And the one at the lower left is one of his watercolors from um, Tunis. And I um, copied it. And uh, the one next to it is also from a ship that has was docked in Ashda, Ashdod in Israel. And that's a picture from the ship of the, of the port. Um, the next one was, um, let's see. Can't remember it's an island, but it's right near Sydney, Australia. And we were in a restaurant, it was pouring, and I couldn't get over the the view in the rain. And I took pictures of it, a lot of pictures of it, because there's people who are still sailing in the rain. So I made I turned that into a painting when I got home. So we're gonna stop here. Yeah, I was just gonna say break. it's time. I'm sure you all are ready for a nice break. So you're gonna time it. Yep. Get rid of So everyone's good. We'll come back in 10 minutes. Okay. Oh, Gabrielle's going to call her mom. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Go ahead. Carry on. Okay. Thank you, Art. Okay. Now, now you have to. What's next? Oh, shoot. <laughs> uh, see, I could never do this by myself. Never, I couldn't do. I couldn't set this up. No, I couldn't do it either. She, she helped me out too. Oh, here's the here's the um. This is the, coconut. Yeah, Robin came back with this picture. Sent me the picture this barn, and I just fell in love with it. I just loved it so much. So um, I did a large painting, which you see in the center, and then I took the same image and I did it in analogous colors, then I did it with sepia and white, and then I was trying to figure out what the other one was that I did, and I think I just changed the colors of the green, I just made it more strident, but um, I still love that barn, I don't know why it never sold, I just don't it's understand. It's giant, first of all, it's giant, so this barn is actually right down the street from uh, Eileen Way and Jerry Aronson. My brother was their neighbor. Okay, next. Um, these are still, I did all these still when I was at the National Academy. I have a collection of those Czech mugs there, Czech mugs and pictures. They're either Austrian and German and whatever, I don't know, but they're from Middle Europa. And I have, I, I was in love with Czechs for a while and I still have them and I love to put them in my paintings. And the picture at the right of that um, was taken from a, friend's window of the race um, um, for the 9-11 um, memorial. Uh, the Brooklyn Bridge is from a photo. The lilies um, was a big lesson for me. Uh, they died after one day, so I had to keep going back to the store every day to get a new lily. Um, and the one below, I mean, on the right, is a, is a completely made up painting. Um, I was trying to see if I could paint just out of my head. And it's another one of those one foot by four foot canvases. Oh, okay. Um, 
the picture at the left was now my husband gal gallery was originally a print gal an antique print gallery and i took a turner black and white print and i i decided to make it into a painting and, and then um i i painted at the met twice in in, wor in workshops there the first one was the george de la tour um um penitent madeline and um that's at the right and then one of my favorite landscapes by george twackman is in the middle and i i re i enjoyed painting there it was really a very interesting experience but um the funniest part about it was the comments from people that come up to you and the questions they would ask us it was um interesting um central park i I, for years and years, I painted in Central Park. That's when I was younger and I could drag all that equipment over there. Um, there's a, a gum tree um, near Belvedere Pal uh, Castle, if any of you all know it, that turns bright red in the fall. It's the most amazing tree. I've only been painted there once and I always say I want to go back. Um, the other two are one, one of, the, of the two that look very much alike. One is a very small painting and another one is a very large one. And that's near the pond on the west side. Of, that's the big boat pond. All, all of these are Central Park. Um, I mean, there are many places to paint there. More of Central Park. Um, again, the Central Park and the middle one has, I have that red background underneath. Every year, Michael used to take me rowing in the in the pond, and um, I would take a lot of pictures while we were rowing. I believe this picture was taken by Robin. She came out with us once, and because I'm rowing, so for some reason I'm rowing, Michael's sitting there, and um, and uh, Robin took the picture. But the above that is a picture I did of that. Um, those are the same. When now we're talking saw, about your, your different oh, charities. Oh, yeah. Oh, studios. Um, I decided at one point to, I, I needed a studio. And I had, oh, you know, I now, I, I, listen, I'm getting 54. so old, I can't. 54. Which is before? My student, my, I'm 54th Street? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. This you is, you this, sold that and, and um, then this is getting, this oh, this is, I'm getting worried. I'm getting old. Um, I bought I bought a studio apartment two blocks away. Uh, this is years ago when they weren't very expensive, and um, I kept that for about five years. Uh, but then a friend of mine from the magazine business uh, had gotten a huge, beautiful room up in Harlem on 131st Street, and she divided it into um, um, uh, cubbies for other painters, and so. I, I sold this apart, I sold the studio, and I went up there and joined them. And it was really, really a wonderful experience. We each had a huge window in our cubby and walls where we could put things up. The only problem was that it was a, quite a commute for me to go up to 125th Street every day. Um, okay. One day when I was at the National Academy, my teacher who again, was only really interested in abstract work, brought in a bunch of broccoli and said, today we're gonna to paint with broccoli. Not, we're not gonna paint broccoli, we're gonna paint with broccoli. And that was the day I quit. And a um, few months later, I got a letter, an email from a friend of mine who had quit the same day and found another school. And she said, Rachel, this is a place that speaks to my heart. That turned out to be the Grand Central Atelier. And this, this is that school, and it's a classical school. This is where I really learned to paint still life and the light. And um, I was put into a cast class, and that's when it was still in the city on 44th Street. <clears throat> now, I had been used to painting landscapes, and when you do plein air painting, um, the object is to get the painting done in two to three hours. Otherwise, the light is completely different. So when I went into that class for the first time, I was assigned the lips. And um, I said to myself, well, I'll, and, and we had to do it in graphite. 
I said, okay, I'll do that this morning. And then this afternoon, I'll do something else. Four months later, I finished it. Um, it was a whole different world, just completely opposite of anything I'd ever done before. Um, it was slow, it was tedious, but it became my Saturday meditation. And these are some of the casts I did in two and a half years where the school was there. Uh, I went from graphite uh, eventually to painting them. Um, and my teacher was Justin Wood and he became my second mentor. And um, the last one that I did there was unfinished. And he and I said, what am I gonna do? I haven't finished this. He said, leave it that way. It, it'll, be a, it'll be good in your collection. Anyway, um, the next, the, this is Justin. And I think he's a master. These are some of his paintings. Um, now on my screen, it looks a little fuzzy, but it, because I'm not looking at it on the big screen. Um, he's just an, he's an amazing teacher, an amazing painter. And um, Medine, so Medine is my, my master for landscape. And Justin is, it has really taught me how to do um, uh, land, um, still life. And he challenges himself constantly, and which which I like. I mean, I take the easy way out most of the time. He's always telling me to slow down, um, but I I sort of want to get it over quickly. But to paint his way, and then this is another amazing teacher who's at Grand Central Atelier. Her name's Katie Whipple. She only does flowers, and I've taken a lot of flower courses with her. Um, but I'll never be able to paint the way she does because she paints one petal at a time. But her things are are, are masterful. Uh, these are just a, 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 a few of her things. Um, uh, okay, at the left is my attempt at doing roses after I had been studying with Katie. And at the right was a class with Justin on painting glass. Um, these are just various things that I did at friends' houses and um, in 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 Canada. Um, I'll go anywhere. And with I have a lot of we have a lot of friends all over the place because of Nadine's glasses. Um, some more of my flowers, but at the one at the far left, I just want to say that that was leftover paint at the end of the day. And I wanted to see how what I could do with it. And I did that in 20 minutes. But you can see there's a big difference between that and the other ones. Um, peonies are, are fun to paint. Then I found what they call antique. Uh, what are these? No. They're carnations. carnations. Antique. I've never seen these before. They're tan carnations. And my own favorite painting of all my flower paintings is the one on the bottom right, and they're they're garden roses. And I just know I just know, for some reason I like that one. Um, I always have criticisms about the rest. Um, the painting at the right is um, still to the wannabe archaeologist because I once did a term paper on Roman frescoes, and this is from the Met, and I I copied that from the Met and I have that hanging behind my bed. And at the left is from a class that I did take at Grand Central Atelier. One teacher was teaching um, painting, painting Roman ruins. And that's actually done from a picture of the painting. Um, what can I say? <laughs> These are just more paintings. I did a number of classes uh, with a teacher that was teaching us to paint like Chardin. And the one on the bottom with the with the white mug and the apples is is sort of a Chardin like. Uh, I think the next slide will show some more of it. No, we're not there yet. Okay, um, these are all paintings I did in workshops. Shadow box. Hmm? Shadow box. Shadow box. Oh, the shadow box. Oh yes, I think the shadow box is another. The one with the with the um. Peppers hanging there is done in a shadow box. The Spanish painters all did their paintings and their still life paintings in shadow boxes. And uh, one of my teachers did a workshop in doing this and he had, he brought in shadow boxes for everybody in the class and I love doing it. And I um, 
took the measurements and Michael had one had his frame or uh, build a shadow box for me. I still use it all the time when I paint now. The upper left is another a Chardin class. Chardin was known for doing uh, things with sort of simple kitchen implements. Um, I'm, I'm not gonna, let's see, comments. Mm -hmm. No, that's my hat. <laughs> that's all I'm gonna say about that one. <laughs> uh, the one at the left, um, I it was done in a workshop and I wanted to learn how to paint iridescence because I love Tiffany glass. And I have a, a vase that my, my, one of my grandmothers brought from England and it's not Tiffany, but it is iridescent. And I put some uh, cow lilies in that. And then um, the middle one, Justin wanted us to bring in something that had to do with animals. And um, all I had were, was, was an ostrich egg and some quail eggs and a decoy. So I threw them together. Uh, the last one is just, it's a bad photo, but there's a bottle of Madeira wine in the background with, with stenciled, um, the name of it stenciled in the, in the glass. Nice. Um, there's one of my Czech mugs. This is a more, much more recent painting. And the painting at the right um, is a painting that mm, I was very excited uh, to find out that the man who was the CEO of the Hearst, my publishing company, uh, he bought this from me and he is a fine painter himself. So I was really thrilled and really flattered that he bought that from me. Uh, the one at the left is a classic Chardin-like painting, and learning to paint grapes was tedious and boring. Um, this is in Justin's class. He said, treat every single grape like it's a portrait, and, and that's what I had to do. But um, you asked about the light. This is, this is the school where I really learned how to pay attention to the light. But this is, um, this was a good 15 years after I started painting in Italy with Medine. Uh, the landscape at the left is Central Park at the right is from Tuscany. It's the largest painting I've ever done. It's four feet by five feet, but I had done the original in the tiny little paper painting in, in um, Tuscany. And then I brought it home and I, I expanded it to a large painting. Um, okay, selling. <laughs> Robin's over here coaching me, telling me what the subjects are, selling paintings. Well, when Michael had a walk-in gallery, we sold a lot, but then he moved to the second floor and he started selling online with first dibs. So first dibs is where most of my paintings are being sold now. And um, this is just sort of a, a typical uh, page out of first dibs. How many? Hmm? How many? How many? What? How many have sold from first Oh, first is, well, I don't know. Phyllis, through the gallery, I've sold about, uh, at this point, about 150 paintings. On first dibs, maybe, um, maybe, you no, know, I, I would say maybe 60 of them were on first dibs. Um, and these are, I do do, do some donations to charity. Um, they're generally, um, a friend of mine works for a company that has a charity and they they use a company called Charity Buzz and it's quite amazing. Um, I have given her some of my, what I consider my not so good paintings and they sell them for outrageous prices because the people that are buying them are wealthy and take it as a tax deduction because it's to a charity. So, um, I'll just tell it. Well, I was going to go back and tell them the story about that one of the last. Oh, yeah. Okay. It's a big lesson. I mean, it's it's a little bit off color, but anyway, that was a workshop I did with Justin. One of my first workshops with him, and I had never, I had never um, painted olives before, and I had never painted silver before. And he said, so. The, and there's a lime in there and lace. And he said the object of painting the silver is you have to paint the reflection exactly as you see it. And I had an antique knife there that as you can see has a round handle. Well, when I got through painting the reflection, 
if you look closely, the reflection looks like a penis. And I just figured that's a painting I'll never be able to sell because of that. So I gave it to them to Charity Buzz as a donation and they sold it right away. So go no. Anyway, um, and then COVID happened and I, my, my school shut down. Um, the florists all shut down. I had bought this Staffordshire vase years ago in the antique center. It's not my general style, but I loved this one and knew I wanted to use it in a painting someday. And so I, in those days, I was going to Whole Foods once a week and they, I was buying flowers there once a week and doing, doing a picture with as many flowers as this, you could never put them all in there at once and paint it because it just takes forever. So this was a, a five week project. Each week I just got a different group of flowers and added it to the painting. And also I love pottery and um, especially pieces I bought in France. And this, I guess my most favorite object that I own is that marbleized, the smaller uh, pot <coughs> that I found in, um, in the south of France and I I went into an antique shop and the owner had a world-class collection of that. It's called Jaspe Ware. I went back the next year to do um, a photography story for Country Living of just about his collection. And then the green pot is um, a concrete pot that I dragged back from Bordeaux a couple, oh, about five years ago. So um, this, I was, I had started this and then lockdown happened and I had to leave all these things in the school for the next couple of months. And uh, then I finally got them back and were allowed in to get our props and I've just finished it. <laughs> so that's one of the ones I finished during COVID. And, um, and then this is a workshop, a virtual workshop that my school did when we had a different project every day for five days. And the project here was to paint uh, a fruit or vegetable that had been cut open. That's when I started taking a pro a, a, well, along the way uh, shots. Um, the next project and the next day we had to paint eggs and I was all set with my ostrich egg and my quail eggs and my real eggs. And, um, I don't, don't even want to talk about the one on the top left because I, I hate it. Uh, the one project we had to do pastry, well, that's one day, and then um, fish. And um, I believe that fish picture is hanging in Robin's kitchen. I'm not sure. Right. Okay. And then we had to do a, a, a cocktail. And I didn't want to just do a cocktail. I wanted that blue liquor, whatever it was. And I learned it was cur Curacao. So now I have a bottle of blue liquor. That's sitting there waiting to be used some someplace again. Um, the donuts have been done so many times over and over again, but that was another workshop I did at, at the Art Students League. Um, I vowed I'd never paint sunflowers, but I saw these when the florist shops began to open again and I couldn't resist. So um, that was also done during COVID. Um, I stopped painting for a year as Michael got worse. And uh, uh, this past July, um, Justin said he would do a workshop in his home in New Jersey for like th for three of us that were in his class. And I did this painting at the left. So that's the most recent painting I've done. Um, and the one on the right, I had started at least five years ago. And it was from a picture I took on my trip to Russia. And um, I, I stopped, I did the, it, it, it was the lake with a reflection of all the trees. And I did the upper half and I got stuck on the bottom because I just didn't know how to make it look like water. And I've just brought it out and it's sitting on my easel now. And I, I'm going to have to go to work to learn how to do that because now I'm beginning to paint again. I don't know why Robin put this up, but I'm getting a kick out of it. Um, I guess all the things that I'm interested in. Want to talk about Riverdale? 
Oh, River's Edge Retirement. Yes, I'm, um, I signed up for um, uh, Life Care Community in Riverdale. It's not gonna be ready and for three years, but um, I'm one of the few that I decided years ago when uh, I don't have, I have only, only have two living relatives and they're both in their 90s and I have no siblings and no children. I always knew I was going to look for a place where I could go and be taken care of when I need it. I was going to go to the Pacific Northwest, but not now that they have the coming earthquake and the fires. And I got a flyer from this place called River's Edge in, in um, Riverdale. And I went up to see it by myself. And I heard, I listened to the infomercial and it made so much sense to me that I signed up for myself and for Michael. And I came home and that's all I talked about. And he said he was, wouldn't be interested in a place like that. But then I didn't stop talking about it. He went up with me. And he also halfway through the infomercial, he said, yeah, this does make a lot of sense. But anyway, I'm, although he won't be with me, I am moving up there. It's, it'll probably be in two and a half years. They haven't broken ground yet. And um, I'm really looking forward to it. So, and uh, this is just a collection of pictures of me with Michael and with my friends and Robin and Cosette and Bob. Hillary Clinton. And, and no, well, I, you put Hillary Clinton in. She's not, a, she's not a friend. I just happen I'm just to. Telling you she's there. <laughs> no, a bunch of editors were invited to the White House when the Clintons were in. And, um, and she, she, uh, she had all the female members of Clinton's staff talk to us. And at the end, we all had a chance to meet her and shake hands. And everything. So, um, and uh, that's it. Um, if anybody has any comments, questions or anything. Uh, so now that I've told you that I've lost my husband, I do want to comment on the fact that um, it, it's been very hard for me. But um, painting is something that I look forward to doing. Painting will save me. And I plan to keep painting for the rest of my life. When I go up to Riverdale, um, the apartment I'm getting is going to have a small space large enough for all my, my equipment. But they're also going to have a, a painting studio but I intend to keep on painting for the rest of my life. I just wanna say you are so impressive and inspirational. I just loved your presentation and your artwork is incredible. Um, I just had a very basic question. I, I've been curious about how you and Robin um, met and established your friendship. I'll tell uh, well, I when when I first met with M met Michael, which was three three weeks before 9-11, um, I volunteered to work in the gallery with him. It was across the street from me. And so working in the gallery, I met so many people. I loved working there. Robin came in one day, and Robin is, as you know, a piece of work. She is a real character. She's a dear friend. But what she brought in was um a Two guys smoking opium. Opium smokers on a piece of cement. And she didn't ask us to give her help framing. She told us exactly what she wanted. And she gave us the name of a manufacturer that would make um, stickly type frames. So that's how the relationship started. Okay, you, 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 won't, you wound several stories together there, but okay. The opium smokers are not in mission. Oh, 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 they're not. Oh, they're in the gold frame. That's right. I can't believe it. That was, that was, um, so basically, I, basically, let me try. Okay. I went in there, and she told. She, I always when when somebody's alone in a restaurant, and I'm traveling with Rachel, I'm like, go get them, because I won't go talk to somebody, but she'll go befriend anybody and invite them into her world. And uh, so somehow, oh, she had some Italian paintings there, and I said I wanted to take a cooking school in Italy, <laughs> and uh, so yeah, I just went on and on from there. <laughs> That's how it goes on. Yeah, no, no, Robin is a, she's a really, she's such a, a I, I don't know, I just say she's a good person. And Robin helps everybody. She's helped me so much in so many ways. She's, um, I just had my new do dog tags made and I had to take Michael's telephone number off and now Robin's going to be the one to call in an emergency. So, mm -hmm. so 
No, but, but Robin is a good painter. She's anyway. <laughs> and 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 if any of you are interested that haven't painted before, or are did. interested in a workshop or have painted or have painted. Um but Dean's workshops in Italy are just wonderful because she's also she cooks, she yeah. cooks too. And um, we we kid her, the old timers all kid her. We say the only reason we come back is for the lunches. Well, I'm going to so. just say something, which is she does landscape painting classes and she does cooking tours. And when you hear the number, you think it's so frightening. And I try to find any place. You couldn't touch her prices with any other company. No. So even though it's expensive, it's a really good value. It is. It's just it's just a wonderful experience. So how do you get information about um, the classes? Are is it posted online or? Oh yeah, their their work their um, website is landscapepainting.com. It couldn't be easier. <laughs> and also, like if you drag along a spouse, they they can just pay a room rate, not for the painting classes, right, Rachel? Yes. And yeah, there's I call them can, the draggies. You can, you can bike and hike and all that stuff. It's really fine. Yeah, it's and the and. And she picks venues where there are not people around because you know a lot of people are, are, don't want other people to watch them and they're struggling. You know they think they're struggling and everything, but they're the most beautiful um, workshop um, landscapes. Just gorgeous. Tuscany is just unbelievable. Are the I workshops went, offered throughout um, the year? Uh, no, they're um, well. Yeah. She does them in the spring and the fall. In in, in ideal times but with the COVID of course nobody was doing anything but um this year she started again and she was going to start with two workshops in the fall but she knew I was just dying to get back to Italy because I, I went there every year for basically uh 24 years and so she said if I could round up four people she would do a workshop in the spring so I got back in June and um with with three other painters one of whom was in London and I, I had I had a struggle trying to get people around here, but I got two from here. And then I emailed this woman in London I hadn't seen in years because she'd been in Medine's classes. And I just said, this is a long shot, but Medine will do a class. If I can get four people, you want to come? And in five minutes, I had an email back saying, I'm in. And so we made it. And it was wonderful just getting back there, just being in Italy. I mean, it's just. Well, I want to say that I love your paintings. I love that your style, um, sort of oh, the softness, you. but also the definiteness. And I echo, echo what Elliot said, just your, uh, you know, <laughs> to think of someone starting, you know, painting lessons later in life and making, uh, becoming a master like yourself is, is just well, a it's, mind boggling. It's, you know, it's the training. It's the training. And I say anybody... And she grew you, up around it. I grew up around, you know, yeah. I, I know about a lot of art history, but doing it. And my my father is an artist. It was, we would call his work impressionistic, but because he was an artist, I just thought that it was just normal. You know, mm -hmm. everybody had a parent who was an artist, um, but it just never occurred to me to paint. And it's just, it, I love it's, it's something I just love doing. And the, the Look, I can I identify, up. I've been to Italy several times with my mother, Rosie, who's on this call, and because her parents are were born in Italy. Uh, oh. And uh, not in Tuscany, <laughs> however, but we have been to Tuscany several times. And I can identify with, with seeing some of those views. And, um, you know, a photograph just doesn't do justice. You, you want no. to... Uh, I can see wanting to copy them to paint them because they're just, I just remember once, I think it was at the Boboli Palace in, in Florence and going up into the gardens and saying, it's, uh, you have to see this, you know, it's just yeah. those stunning oh, vistas. Florence is wonderful. Florence is just, it's incredible. If I, you know, if I had had an apartment in Florence, I never would have sold it. I mean, our town of Boncovento was, uh, it was an old, um, it's a farmer's town. And, you know, there's, Medina and Joe have a little studio um, 
a, a, a gallery on, at the bottom of our building and the people in the town don't even come in. I mean, they're not interested in art at all. I, I think a lot of Italians don't even appreciate their patrimony, um, but but Italy is just, where, where in Italy where you're, was your mother from? Or what was her name? I don't know if I, yes, it's um, from uh, the town of Bonefro. It's in the current Molise, the state of Molise, more toward the uh, Adriatic, oh, um, high in the mountains. There's mom. She could tell you about Bonefro. Is that near Trieste? No, no, Trieste Not is up. quite it's right. More near like Termine, or it's not too. Mom, do you want to say where Bonefro is? Oh, you're muted. You're muted, Mom. Rosie, you're, on mute. you're muted. <laughs> can't hear you. Rosie, Mom, you're muted. You there she goes. Well, when the Italians came, it was a brutto. And, and now it's in the province of Molise. Oh. Southern Italy, just east of Rome. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. See, Italy, Italy, my gosh, even all the traveling I've done there, there's always something more to see. Every single little town has something gorgeous. I mean, it's just, to me, there's just nothing like it. Um, I mean, I love travel. I'll go anywhere. But Italy is just so special. And, um, and one, one of the funny things about that I learned in bon, living in Boncomento is that Italy in many ways is still tribal in that they're competing. Everybody's competing with everybody else. And if we dare to go outside of Bon Convento to have a meal, the people in Bon Convento, if they found out about it, they say, why are you going? Our pasta is much better than theirs. <laughs> and, and we would hear this over and over again. It, it was, it's just fun. I just, I, then the people were so lovely. Um, I never really learned to speak Italian. I could, I could get along. Um, I could get along. That's about it. But every year when I went back, the people in the town would say, oh, your Italian is getting so much better. It wasn't getting any better. It was exactly the same. But they were they were just wonderful to me when I was putting my apartment together and having to shop for things, you know, for ironing boards and fly swatters and things like that. The people were so welcoming. And, and it's and I just I I fell in love with Italy. I'll always be in love with Italy. So Barbara Ann, do you want to chime in at all? I'm just having fun listening to everybody. <laughs> and Elliot? Uh, my, actually, I'm not, I very much enjoyed this. It, it, yes. Uh, what I did is, is, as Robin knows, I mean, I haven't been, my wife, my wife passed in 2018, and I've had a, a long odyssey. And so, and those places in Rockport, I have, I'm a sailor. And so mm -hmm. I'm not on land. So I've sailed all up and down the East Coast, especially in New England. And I've been in Gloucester Harbor and Rockport and Ipswich and all of that. So I've always seen I've always seen all those things from the sea. And but what I did but I did is I, I went up, I went up, Are there less ticks in the ocean? Are you what? <laughs> Are there less ticks in the ocean? Oh, there's no ticks in the ocean. There's other <laughs> problems, but nevertheless, the problem about being on a sailboat is, or any boat, is there's a hatch in the back of the boat, and there's a little man at the bottom of the hatch that keeps on saying, "Send more money." Nevertheless, <laughs> um, nevertheless, what I did for the very first time was I was in Maine for a month of October, and there's a wonderful school of Maine called the Maine Media Workshops. And I took a, um, an intensive, um, I'm not a computer guy, but I took an intensive Adobe Premiere uh, editing, how to edit uh, uh, photography and digital photography and, and films. And uh, I'm gonna buy the equipment I need to do some post-production editing, which I haven't done in a lot of years. I was a TV producer and director for about uh, 15 years. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but, you know, life has a way of getting in the way, and uh, I have time now, and I'm going to go back to, I'm trying to go back to doing maybe my uh, documentary type 
work, and so one of the works actually I want to do while I'm asking you is I'm very, very interested in what I call the creative process. Of how the, people, what? the creative, oh, process. creative process. How, how you get from, even when you take the picture of, as an artist, how you find out something like you do what you want to do and how you have made this transition, which you've talked about, into um, growing, uh, growing your art or growing, growing the thing that you want to do and how you, you know, navigate that. And I'm really very interested in that, but I like to, just like you did it, I would, as you've done it this way, I would have you on to take your, what you had there. And I would just, uh, you know, we could go, we could go travel the world and you could see how you could, uh, you interpreted the things that you created. So I'm, 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 play, I'm playing around with that in my head. Mm. But I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be that, try, I, I'm not interested in taking your painting. But. Rosie, I'm yeah. glad you finally joined. Pardon me, what? Rosie. Oh. <laughs> I'm glad you joined. Right, but I appreciate what you've done. I love your work. Yes. Oh, thank you. I, thank some, you. I just absolutely love some of the things you have, and I'm going to go to that website or whatever, take a look. Okay. Well, the thing is, representational art has been out of fashion for a long time and, and a lot of very young people want only contemporary abstract art but um it it doesn't some of it interests me i mean i to me when i think of abstract art that i love i think of kandinsky and i i i, I just love his work but not all of it uh just certain periods of his work but um but i i it's it's what i said in the beginning i I want to wake up and look at something that uh, that is beautiful. That I guess that's that's my feeling about it. And then I I want it. I want to possess it. And um, and I I and I think also because my mother taught me to do so many things with my hands when I was younger, um, knit and crochet and 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 sew. And so I was always able to do things with my hands, but painting is, it's more than that. It's, it's, it's really your hands and your eyes and what you see. And that's what I've learned from my teachers is to really learn how to see what you're, what you're painting and to see the lights and the darks and see what the light does to the object. I mean, what you do with the glass, I mean, shooting as a photographer, shooting black on black and having and seeing the definition so it's not all black and you see the nuances the nuances of grays and you're not doing it in black and white you're doing it in color and so uh, some of your paintings that you have that are still lifes that are what i call are black on black are, i really love the one i like i like them a lot oh, thank, thank you very, very much very difficult to convey that. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you very you. much. Rachel. Thank you. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. much. Really thank enjoyed you. it. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. This, this was you have to know, and Robin will tell you, I was I was really very nervous about this because uh, because this is... I didn't feel I was prepared. But then I realized, you know, I have a tendency to talk too much anyway. So I just threw away the notes. And <laughs> Uh, thank yes, you. Thank you all thank you. Your, your work speaks volumes. Yes, thank you so much. Beautiful. Thank you very much. Very very thank you. You're encouraging me to keep going. So. We're going to make her do a class, another class. No, no. No, you're going to do the, you're gonna do the <laughs> art of Sicily. No, no, Venice, the art of Venice, the art scholar. Very oh. good. Oh. No, I'd, I'd be, no, I'd be better off as a travel agent. Stay tuned. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Right, thank, you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Very, very thank much. you. Thank you. Good night. Right. Night.